Welcome to today's global briefing, where we delve into the escalating tensions and complex dynamics shaping international relations. In the Middle East, the situation grows increasingly precarious as Israel and Hezbollah intensify their attacks, raising fears of a broader regional conflict. Amid these developments, Greece expresses concerns that Israel faces insufficient pressure to cease its operations in Gaza. While China has voiced strong support for Lebanon in response to Israeli airstrikes, on a different note, Iran's president has indicated a willingness to ease tensions with Israel, highlighting the shifting alliances in the region. In the backdrop of these events, U.S. President Biden has designated the UAE as a major defense partner, focusing on the growing instability in the Middle East. Meanwhile, NORAD reports the detection of Russian military aircraft near Alaska, underscoring rising tensions in the Arctic. In Europe, Ukrainian President Zelensky accuses Russia of leveraging Chinese satellites to target Ukraine's nuclear plants, further complicating the ongoing conflict. Turkish President Erdogan has urged the U.S. to lift defense sanctions, emphasizing the geopolitical ramifications of these sanctions. Shifting our attention to cybersecurity, Sweden has accused Iran of orchestrating cyber attacks linked to Quran burnings, while Canadian Michael Kovrig recounts his harrowing experiences of psychological torture during his detention in China. North Korea's Kim Yo-jong has criticized the U.S. for its nuclear submarine presence, and South Korea has issued a warning regarding North Korean trash balloons, indicating the ongoing tensions on the Korean peninsula. Lastly, in a surprising diplomatic move, India has extended an unprecedented invite to Myanmar's anti-junta forces, signaling a potential shift in regional alliances. In Taiwan, a dedicated war resiliency team is set to convene, reflecting the increasing tensions with China. Join us as we explore these critical issues and their implications for global security and stability. Israel and Hezbollah escalate attacks amid fears of regional conflict. Tensions between Israel and Hezbollah have escalated, with Israel launching airstrikes on Hezbollah targets in southern Lebanon, while the Iran-backed group retaliated by attacking military sites in northern Israel. These latest exchanges come after Lebanon experienced its deadliest day in decades, with nearly 500 people killed. The Israeli military reported hitting dozens of Hezbollah positions, including missile launchers and weapon storage facilities. Hezbollah responded by attacking an explosives factory deep inside Israel, as well as the Megiddo airfield. After nearly a year of conflict with Hamas in Gaza, Israel's attention has now shifted to the northern front, where Hezbollah has been firing rockets into Israel in support of Hamas. The situation has led to mass displacement in Lebanon, where hospitals are overwhelmed by the rising number of casualties. International concern is growing, with calls for diplomacy to prevent the conflict from spiraling into a wider war. There are fears that Israel's ally, the United States, and Iran, which supports Hezbollah, could be drawn into the conflict, destabilizing the entire region. Israel has struck about 1,600 Hezbollah targets since Monday, but the group remains a formidable adversary, with advanced weaponry and decades of military experience. As both sides continue to exchange fire, the possibility of a broader war looms, with Lebanon's already fragile situation on the brink of collapse. Greece, Israel facing insufficient pressure to end Gaza war. Greece's foreign minister, George Garapatridis, expressed concern that Israel is not under enough international pressure to halt the war in Gaza. Speaking during the United Nations General Assembly, he emphasized that while Greece remains a strategic partner of Israel, there needs to be more effective diplomatic action to prevent the conflict from spreading particularly in Lebanon. Greece condemned the October 7th attack by Hamas, but has also called for an end to Israel's military operations in Gaza, which have resulted in more than 41,000 deaths, according to Palestinian authorities. Gerard Petritus warned that the escalation at the Israel-Lebanon border has exposed a failure of the international community to prevent the conflict from spreading. He described Lebanon as a minefield, that could spark wider regional instability. Greece is also working on a humanitarian initiative to bring children affected by the war in Gaza to Europe for care. The country aims to take in around 500 children as part of ongoing efforts with EU members, Palestinians, and Israelis. China expresses strong support for Lebanon amid Israeli airstrikes. China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, has expressed firm support for Lebanon's sovereignty and security following Israel's large-scale airstrikes. In a meeting with Lebanon's foreign minister Abdallah Bouhabib in New York, Wang condemned the attacks, which Lebanese authorities say have killed 492 people and forced tens of thousands to flee. Wang reaffirmed China's stance, emphasizing that Beijing stands with Lebanon 
and the Arab world in defending justice. He highlighted China's opposition to indiscriminate attacks on civilians and expressed concern over the growing humanitarian crisis caused by the conflict. China has been actively promoting peace in the Middle East, and Wang urged the international community to take a clear stand against the violence. He also called for a permanent ceasefire and the implementation of a two-state solution as the only path to long-term peace. Iran's president opened to easing tensions with Israel. Iran's president, Masoud Pazeshkian, announced that Iran is willing to de-escalate tensions with Israel, provided that Israel demonstrates the same commitment. Speaking ahead of his first appearance at the UN General Assembly, Pazeshkian emphasized that Iran does not seek to destabilize the region, stating, We're willing to put all our weapons aside, so long as Israel is willing to do the same. Tensions between Iran and Israel have intensified after a recent explosion in Lebanon, for which Israel has not taken responsibility, but which Iran blames on Israeli forces. The blast, which targeted Hezbollah, Iran's ally, has heightened fears of a broader regional conflict. Pazishkian warned that such a war would benefit no one, and reiterated Iran's support for peace while maintaining a firm stance against injustices. Pazeshkian also addressed concerns over Iran's nuclear program, signaling a willingness to return to negotiations and revive the original nuclear accord with the West. He called for the removal of economic sanctions on Iran, stressing that his government is committed to fulfilling the terms of the deal. Additionally, Pazeshkian denied U.S. claims that Iran is supplying weapons to Russia in its war against Ukraine, emphasizing that Iran does not support Russian aggression and has not provided ballistic missiles to Moscow. Biden designates UAE as major defense partner, focuses on Middle East instability. President Joe Biden has officially designated the United Arab Emirates, UAE, as a major defense partner of the United States, placing it alongside India, the only other country with this status. This designation will enable closer military cooperation between the U.S. and UAE through joint training, exercises, and collaborative defense efforts. In a meeting between Biden and UAE President Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the leaders discussed the ongoing conflict in Gaza and the wider instability in the Middle East. They emphasized the need for urgent, unhindered humanitarian aid to Gaza and expressed a shared commitment to reaching a ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas. Biden also addressed concerns about the situation in Lebanon, where Israeli airstrikes reportedly killed 492 people on Monday. He stressed the importance of de-escalation efforts and ensuring the safe return of civilians to their homes. The two leaders also touched on the UAE's involvement in the Sudan conflict, stressing that there is no military solution to the crisis, which has led to the world's largest displacement of people. In addition to defense cooperation, Biden and Sheikh Mohammed discussed deepening ties in space exploration, clean energy and artificial intelligence, areas where the UAE has drawn significant interest, particularly from China. Vice President Kamala Harris also met with Sheikh Mohammed separately, expressing deep concerns about the conflict in Sudan and the atrocities committed against civilians. NORAD detects Russian military aircraft near Alaska amid rising tensions. The North American Aerospace Defense Command detected four Russian military aircraft flying near Alaska on Monday. This comes less than two weeks after U.S. Army soldiers were deployed to the region in response to an increase in Russian and Chinese military exercises. The Russian aircraft remained in international airspace within Alaska's Air Defense Identification Zone, ADIZ, and did not enter American or Canadian sovereign airspace. NORAD emphasized that such activity occurs regularly and is not considered a direct threat. This latest detection follows several other instances this month where NORAD intercepted Russian military aircraft near Alaska. In response to ongoing Russian military drills, the U.S. Army deployed units from the 11th Airborne Division, also known as the Arctic Angels, to Shemya Island, Alaska, on September 12th. These troops are part of a force protection operation aimed at demonstrating readiness and strength in the Arctic region. The 11th Airborne Division is typically based at Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson and Fort Wainwright, Alaska. Zelensky accuses Russia of using Chinese satellites to target Ukraine's nuclear plants. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has accused Russia of using Chinese satellites to photograph Ukraine's nuclear power stations, suggesting that Russia may be preparing to strike them. In an interview with ABC's Robin Roberts, Zelensky explained that, Based on Ukraine's experience, when Russia takes photos of critical facilities, it often signals a looming attack. He called this nuclear terror 
and plans to share this intelligence with world leaders who can influence Russia. The accusation adds a new dimension to Russia's reliance on China amid the ongoing war. Although China has stopped short of providing direct weapons to Russia, its growing assistance has raised concerns in the West. U.S. officials have warned that China is now supplying military components to support Russia's war effort. Zelensky's warning follows similar alerts from Ukrainian intelligence, which has reported that Russia may target Ukraine's nuclear infrastructure ahead of winter, particularly transformer substations connected to power plants. Experts have raised concerns about the dangers of these strikes, as they could damage critical energy systems and potentially lead to a nuclear safety incident. The situation is dire as Ukraine's energy infrastructure continues to suffer from Russian attacks. With half of its energy generation capacity already destroyed, Ukraine is bracing for a harsh winter, relying on only a fraction of its pre-war power output. Rolling blackouts have become a part of daily life as authorities work to preserve the grid. Zelensky's interview and further details about these developments can be seen on ABC News and Hulu this week. Turkey's Erdogan urges U.S. to lift defense sanctions. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan is calling on the U.S. to lift sanctions that have been hindering Turkey's defense purchases and trade relations. These sanctions, which include restrictions under the Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act, CAESA, were imposed after Turkey bought Russian S-400 missile defense systems in 2019, leading to its removal from the F-35 fighter jet program. During his visit to the UN General Assembly in New York, Erdogan addressed Turkish and American business leaders, saying that cooperation between the two countries, especially in the defense industry, has fallen short of its potential due to these sanctions. He highlighted Turkey's long-term goal of boosting bilateral trade with the U.S. to $100 billion, up from $30 billion in 2023. Erdogan expressed hope that relations were improving, referencing the recent approval of Turkey's request to purchase F-16 fighter jets and modernization kits after Turkey supported Sweden's bid to join NATO. However, he called for more permanent steps, including lifting export restrictions and abandoning extra tariffs on sectors like steel and aluminum. Erdogan also pointed out Turkey's role in supply chains, including cooperation in the production of crucial military ammunition, such as the 155mm shells used in the Ukraine-Russia war. While Turkey supports Ukraine, it has refused to join sanctions against Russia, but promises not to allow sanctions to be violated within its borders. In addition to the F-16s, Turkey has shown interest in purchasing Eurofighter Typhoon jets from Germany, Britain and Spain, but progress has been slow partly due to reluctance from Germany. The Turkish leader also met with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in New York, emphasizing Ankara's readiness to deepen cooperation in various areas that would benefit both countries. Sweden accuses Iran of cyber attack over Quran burnings. Swedish authorities are accusing Iran of launching a cyber attack that sent thousands of text messages across Sweden, calling for revenge over the controversial public burnings of the Quran that took place during the summer of 2023. According to Swedish officials, the attack was carried out by Iran's paramilitary Revolutionary Guard, which hacked into a Swedish SMS service and sent about 15,000 messages in Swedish. The messages, sent by a group calling itself the Anzu Team, demanded retaliation against those responsible for the Quran burnings. Swedish media showed examples of the texts, with one message saying, those who desecrated the Quran must have their work covered in ashes and referring to Swedes as demons. The burnings were part of protests held under Sweden's constitutionally protected right to free speech. While these events sparked international outrage, including from Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who condemned them as a dangerous event, Sweden emphasized that these acts did not represent the country's official position. Swedish officials also noted that this cyber attack appeared to have a larger goal, portraying Sweden as an Islamophobic country and increasing divisions within society. Iran's involvement is seen as a serious attempt to destabilize Sweden and polarize its population. This situation unfolded at a time when Sweden was working to gain NATO membership, a process that faced delays partly due to protests like these, which angered NATO member Turkey. Sweden's security agency SO revealed that the Iranian state used criminal networks to carry out attacks targeting Israeli or Jewish interests in Sweden. Although the investigation into the SMS attack has been closed for now, authorities may reopen it if new information arises. Canadian Michael Kovrig recounts psychological torture in Chinese detention. 
Michael Kovrig, one of two Canadian men detained in China for over 1,000 days on espionage charges, has opened up about his harrowing experience in solitary confinement and relentless interrogation. His story sheds light on the intense psychological ordeal he endured. Kovrig, along with fellow Canadian Michael Spavor, became the center of a tense diplomatic standoff between Canada and China. Their detention began on December 10, 2018, when Chinese authorities seized Kovrig while he was walking home with his pregnant partner in Beijing. He was blindfolded, handcuffed, and thrown into a black SUV, then placed in solitary confinement for six months. During this time, Kovrig was interrogated daily for up to nine hours, locked in a chair, and often left to survive on just three bowls of rice a day. He described this as psychological torture. This three-year ordeal was sparked by Canada's arrest of Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou, which led to heightened tensions between Ottawa and Beijing. Although China denied any connection between the arrest of Meng and the detention of the two Canadians, many saw their imprisonment as political retaliation. The two Canadians were released in 2021, shortly after Meng was allowed to return to China. Kovrig's account is heartbreaking. After his release, he returned to Canada, where he met his daughter for the first time, a profoundly emotional moment after years of separation from his family. He described it as the most fantastic, heartwarming feeling you can imagine. His story is a stark reminder of the complexities of international relations and the very human cost of diplomatic tensions. North Korea's Kim Yo-jong criticizes U.S. nuclear submarine presence. In recent statements, Kim Yo-jong, the influential sister of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, has condemned the arrival of a U.S. nuclear submarine at the South Korean port of Busan. According to North Korea's state media, KCNA, Kim views this deployment as a demonstration of U.S. intentions to showcase its nuclear capabilities and escalate threats in the region. The USS Vermont arrived in Busan on Monday for resupply and crew rest, as reported by South Korea's Navy. Kim Yo-jong's comments come in the wake of a trilateral meeting involving the foreign ministers of South Korea, the United States, and Japan. During this meeting, concerns were raised regarding North Korea's recent disclosure of its uranium enrichment facilities and its ongoing military cooperation with Russia. The three countries are now looking to convene a trilateral summit before the end of the year to address these pressing issues. The situation underscores the heightened tensions in the region as North Korea continues to pursue its military ambitions amid international scrutiny. South Korea issues warning on North Korean trash balloons. South Korea has announced that it will take decisive military action if any injuries or fatalities result from the wave of trash-carrying balloons launched from North Korea. Since May, North Korea has sent over 5,500 balloons filled with garbage into South Korean airspace, causing disruptions, fires, and even hitting government buildings. This tactic is Pyongyang's response to activists in the South who have been sending balloons carrying propaganda to the North. According to Lee Sun Jun from South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff, the military will act decisively if these balloons pose a serious safety threat or if someone is killed as a result of their release. While most of the balloons contain waste paper, recent launches have included new devices that have caused fires, raising safety concerns. The situation escalated further when the latest balloon launch briefly disrupted flights at Incheon Airport. In response to these provocations, South Korea has suspended military agreements with Pyongyang and resumed propaganda broadcasts along the border. Tensions between North and South Korea are currently at a low point, with North Korea recently deploying 250 ballistic missile launchers near the southern border. The North has also revealed images of its uranium enrichment facility for the first time, showcasing leader Kim Jong-un's call for increased centrifuge production to bolster its nuclear arsenal. Experts warn that North Korea could conduct its seventh nuclear test at any time, particularly as the U.S. presidential election approaches. This ongoing situation highlights the escalating tensions and complexities in inter-Korean relations. India extends unprecedented invite to Myanmar's anti-junta forces. In a significant diplomatic shift, India has invited political and military opponents of Myanmar's ruling junta to attend a seminar in New Delhi. This move comes amid ongoing civil unrest in Myanmar, following the military's ousting of an elected government in a coup back in February 2021, a situation that now threatens to destabilize India's 1,650-kilometer border with Myanmar. The seminar, scheduled for mid-November and hosted by the Indian Council of World Affairs, aims to discuss constitutionalism and federalism. 
Sources indicate that representatives from Myanmar's parallel national unity government and various ethnic minority rebel groups will participate. This marks a notable first for India, as it engages with non-state actors in Myanmar's ongoing conflict. Sui Kar, vice chairman of the Chin National Front, one of the ethnic groups invited, expressed optimism, stating, This will be the first time, I think formally, that India will engage with the non-state actors. This is a good, positive approach. However, the junta has not been invited to the seminar, and has consistently labeled the rebel groups as terrorists. The military government did not respond to requests for comment regarding the event. While Western nations have imposed sanctions and condemned Myanmar's military for its actions, India has maintained a level of engagement with the junta. This includes high-level visits and ongoing collaboration on infrastructure projects, such as the $400 million Kaladan Port and Highway Project aimed at connecting India's northeastern states with Thailand through Myanmar. India's Foreign Minister S.J. Shankar previously voiced concerns about border instability and the security risks to India's investments in Myanmar. This seminar signals a potential shift in India's foreign policy approach, inviting questions about its intentions. The November meeting represents India's most serious effort to connect with Myanmar's pro-democracy factions since the coup and may reflect a broader strategy to balance its diplomatic ties while addressing security concerns along its border. As the ASEAN grouping attempts to mediate peace in Myanmar, with little progress since its efforts began in April 2021, India's proactive engagement may serve as a crucial development in the ongoing conflict. Taiwan's War Resiliency Team to Convene Amid Rising Tensions with China In a proactive step to bolster its defenses, Taiwan President Lai ching te is set to hold the first meeting of a civil defense committee aimed at enhancing the archipelago's resilience in the face of potential emergencies. This initiative comes at a time when tensions with China are escalating. The committee, which was formed in June following Lai's inauguration, will convene on Thursday. Its primary focus will be on training and utilizing civilian resources to maintain the functionality of critical infrastructure, including key energy facilities. Additionally, the agenda will address the safety of information, transportation and financial networks, as well as strategies for medical care and emergency evacuations. President Lai emphasized the necessity of a strong will for self-defense to effectively navigate various disasters and risks. His formation of this committee reflects a growing concern over Taiwan's preparedness for any crises that may arise, especially given China's increasing assertiveness. China, which views Taiwan as a territory that must be unified with the mainland, by force if necessary, has expressed discontent with Lai's administration. Following his inauguration, Beijing conducted major military drills around Taiwan, ramping up pressure on the island and its offshore territories. Furthermore, it has removed tariff exemptions on certain Taiwanese exports, a move Taipei condemns as an attempt to pressure and intimidate the island's 23 million residents. Despite the escalating military maneuvers, China maintains that it prefers a peaceful resolution to the Taiwan issue. In a notable remark last year, Lai's predecessor, Tsai Ing-wen, pointed out that China is currently preoccupied with its domestic economic and political challenges, which may deter any immediate military ambitions. As Taiwan prepares for this critical meeting, the focus remains on ensuring the island's readiness in the face of increasing geopolitical pressures.